we can't change the past, right? And yeah, if we spend time complaining about he did this and she did this, and well, you just get stuck and it creates further distrust. When in reality, this is somebody you loved at one time or who you were, let's say, a business part. You had really good intentions. You got along. It was a solid relationship. Hello, and welcome to the Emotional Expedition Podcast. I'm Meg Thomas, and if you want to live a more open-hearted, magical life, it all starts with your emotions. This podcast will take you on a journey, helping you to better understand, express, release, and heal your emotions. Let's get exploring. Welcome. I am so honored and thrilled to have a new friend, Kim Corvin, here. And Kim went from being a conflict avoider to the conflict queen, which is the best name ever. I myself, massive conflict avoider, and I have had to work through a whole lot to not be the conflict avoider that I once was. So I really honor that. And her, she went from becoming a lawyer to a mediator. And now she helps businesses and families across North America, Europe, the intrinsic benefit in transforming relationships through creating customized, fair solutions. She lives in Regina, Saskatchewan. I had to look it up where it was to see and know exactly where she was going to be calling in from on the globe. She lives with her husband, two children, many rescue greyhounds and cats who may be making visits today, we hope. (laughs) or not, whichever. And Kim's here today to help us get ready for the holiday season, which can really be a time for many of us that can bring up a whole lot of conflict and emotions. She's going to share some tips with us for the holidays, how to better understand the relationship between our emotions and conflicts. And we are so happy to have you here. Welcome, Kim. Well, thank you, Meg. It's, It's a real honor to be here truly is. And to be with someone who is spiritual as well as practical, Mm. it's a real joy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we like to start with how you got to where you are today. So what was little Kim like? And what was your relationship with your emotions? What were you like as a child? Well, first off, if anyone tried to call me Kimmy, I would beat them up. Okay, so feisty. And um, it was actually, and what I didn't realize till I was about 56 years old was that I was highly sensitive. So I remember being at my grandparents' farm. My brother and I would go there in the summer and spend like weeks or, you know, weekends. And one time when we were there and I was four, my grandma and my aunt were cooking. And my uncle and my grandpa were doing something in the basement. And so the the women said to me, oh, go tell the men supper's ready. So I went to the landing and I peered over and I said, supper's ready. And my uncle in this deep voice said, we'll be up in about five minutes. And my little soul felt absolutely crushed through the tone. And so I went out the back door and they had a barbecue with a shelf on the bottom and a skirt around it. And I just sat there, hidden. And I knew my family wouldn't understand. I mean, they were looking, wondering, did I fall into the dugout? Did I fall into an old cistern? They were frantic. And I never, ever told anybody why for years and years. But so my childhood was a lot of experiences of me having this knowing this sensitivity that nobody around me had, except perhaps my great grandmother. Mm. She, like my great grandmother and her daughter, um, my great aunt, my great aunt could call me Kimmy. No one else. But those two women I knew, I sensed they loved me unconditionally. And I mean, and, and when I say I was feisty, I remember when I was six, I lived on a street with a lot of boys, 
and we had a playhouse in our backyard. And uh, the boys had never seen female form. And they were like, hey, Kim, can we see what your body looks like? (laughs) And I had a brother a year older than me. So, okay, whatever. So it was the strip show in our playhouse. And it was all very fine until one of my friends told his mom. (laughs) (laughs) Right? And so I was subjected to a lot of shaming about how could you do this? And the boys were banned from our playhouse. And (laughs) it was the early 1970s. Okay. I think that picture paints that paints a a really great picture of where where we started and that mm-hmm. empathetic sensitive soul mixed in with the feistiness which I'm sure served you very well as a lawyer as well. So take us on that journey. Yeah. Okay. How how do we what happens when we grow up? Do you keep that sensitivity about you? Well, I think the sensitivity was shut down to a great extent growing up as a survival mechanism. And I mean, we had livestock and I remember I had a colt and when he was two, he got into some wheat and he foundered, which meant his hooves, instead of growing straight down, would curl up. So Mm -hmm. he would never be suitable for riding, way too dangerous. So... I had to make the decision to send him off to the glue factory. Mm -hmm. This is a living soul that I had raised. So to get through that, you do shut down. And I lived in my head. And law school, it was something I started thinking about when I was 16. And then I went on a youth exchange to Indonesia out of high school. And then a farm exchange to the Caribbean after that. Then I started university. And so when I was in, and then I was a political activist. So once again, living in my head and law school, it would periodically come up. And I thought, I don't want to be part of the establishment. Mm -hmm. No. But when I was about 25, I took myself, just me, to Mexico for a two week vacation. And uh, I ended up, and I was lonely. Like I, I got to my lonely planet guidebook hotel room and it was just so stark and I thought I was going to cry and I did not cry at that stage in my life. That was the ultimate weakness, right? I was suppressing my emotions. So I went for a walk and a timeshare salesman was, hey, you want to come to a nice resort? Mm. And so I got into a conversation with him and I was pretty cocky because I had been to timeshare presentations before when I traveled with friends. No problem. But I ended up making a deposit of $750 for a timeshare. And it was my parents' credit card, right? I didn't even have my own credit card. It was the first time I ever traveled with a credit card for emergencies. And that happened. And I was com- felt completely crushed. And I felt such shame that I had been taken. And I mean, I was there from before nine to four. Like, it took a long time for them to convince me. And uh, I got home, like, and it wrecked my vacation. And I told a friend, and she introduced me to a lawyer. And the lawyer was like, well, what's the jurisdiction? What does it say about jurisdiction, Kim? And I said, California. She said, don't worry about it. It's not enough money. So these people would phone, but I decided then that I never wanted to be taken like that again. Mm Mm-hmm. And so before I'd left, I'd applied to study communications out east, and I had applied to one law school. So it was that experience that sent me in the path of becoming a lawyer. So talk about the ultimate conflict avoidance, right? I could not say to them, no, I don't want this. And I knew even in the process, and they're telling me about the annual fees, I'm like, that's more than the than the very clean hotel room I'm staying in. Like, why would I want this? This is stupid. But I didn't have the words. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the boundaries. Did you ever make it to the pool that day? No. (laughs) Oh, no. No. (laughs) Oh, yeah. What a lesson. And they had the credit card for, I didn't get the credit, like they took the credit card. Oh, do you want to get your credit rating checked? Oh, sure. That sounds like fun. (laughs) I didn't get it back till hours later. Once I was signing the contract. 
Mm -hmm. And I remember I was, I'd wintered with my parents that year. So they were, I mean, I had the money to pay the deposit, but they were completely appalled that this had happened. And Mm -hmm. so the shame factor again from the family about doing something like this. And, uh, and I remember telling my mom before I went away to work that summer because the timeshare people were phoning. I said, well, just tell them that I've taken a vow of poverty. And she's looking at me, right? She was raised Catholic. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's true. I'm going back to school. <laughs> mm. So that's how I ended up in law school. Wow. So we go to law school. Mm-hmm. Where did you go to law school? I went to law school in Saskatoon, um, Mm -hmm. which is about two and a half hours from here. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful little city on a river. And I actually, I loved law school. Yeah. It was like I'd studied sociology as a first degree. So you're looking at problems without any kind of solution orientation. And law school, all of a sudden, I am, you know, and this is Kim living in her head this wonderful form of dispute resolution, right? It's objective. Mm. There's no room for ucky feelings. The emotions aren't part of it. And it's somebody neutral deciding. And so in other words, I was very annoying for family and friends who would describe problems to me. And I would be like, oh, this is a bailment situation. You need to do X, Y, Z. But it was a good time. It was really, really a good stretch. And one of my favorite memories from law school is actually I took feminist legal theory and I had this wonderful professor, Donna Greshner is her name, and you can look her up. She's really an incredible human being. But my paper for that, like I got to write poetry for assignments on the readings, but then my paper was on the movie Thelma and Louise. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which is not what you expect from law school. No. Mm -hmm. And I tell people that and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Did you really feel at that time that becoming a lawyer was separate from having feelings, right? I heard a little bit of that in what you just said, which was it being objective. And and I didn't trust feelings at all, Meg. Yeah. They were just yeah. like, yuck, stay away. Mm. How do I avoid them? Yeah. And so when you did become a lawyer, how did that show up? Was that really the case for you? Well, what was interesting, there were two things that happened when I was a real baby lawyer. Mm-hmm. And I should say in that year, I studied William Glasser's theory. It was called reality therapy then which I think was kind of a turning point. But there were two files I worked on. And one was my first small claims trial. You know, it was too small for any of the experienced lawyers to do, but let's give Kim some experience in court. And it was a contract dispute over a landowner was supposed to reimburse my client for the materials, and my client had built a fence on the landlord's property. And I remember the landlord bringing a board from the fence to court and being absolutely terrified. How am I going to deal with this? My client was successful, but the court discounted for the taxes my client had paid on the materials. So I'm ecstatic, right? Like this is a two-figure difference. It's nothing. And I'm ecstatic because look at me. I'm a great advocate for my client. We were successful. My client, though, had a completely different opinion. He was furious. The judge didn't listen to me, right? And this is not fair. He didn't give me all my money back and on and on. And I'm like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. You won. And we had several discussions because my client is talking about appealing. And I'm like, appealing over two figures? Like you're going to spend four. Yeah. It was just so completely illogical, his response. And so I thought about it a lot. And one day when I was walking, I thought back to the first time we met and what he had told me 
about the situation. So the next time we talked, and I said to him, um, just hold on here. Because I remembered that his daughter and grandkids lived where he built the fence. And he'd also told me it was a really busy street. So I said, well, didn't you build the fence to keep your grandchildren safe? Hmm. And he stopped. And he was like, yeah. And then he was fine with the result. And I'm like, look at that. His, and I mean, that's something that stuck with me more than 25 years. But once his interests were acknowledged, what his why was for doing it, he was okay. But the whole legal process completely ignored that human element. Wow. And then the second one involved the first time I did an appeal from an administrative hearing decision. And I represented four men. We were unsuccessful. And three of them paid me and one of them didn't. And the one who didn't, he had told me he had like a Camaro or an old Ford Mustang, some kind of muscle car in his garage that he was very, very proud of. And I was dreaming of suing him, getting a default judgment against him, and then sending the sheriff to (laughs) seize his favorite possession. Because how dare he not pay me, right? Like no passive aggressiveness there at all. But that was my idea of what I was going to do. In the meantime, Christmas was approaching. And the firm had commissioned like a pencil sketch of the city for Christmas cards. And I could send Christmas cards to whoever I wanted. And I thought, oh, I'm going to send them to my clients, my little wee client list. And there were these four names and three I wanted to send Christmas cards to. And the fellow who was being a jerk, there was no way I wanted to send him a card. But I didn't want his friends to think I was a jerk if they got cards and he didn't. So because I didn't want to appear small-minded, I sent him a Christmas card too. And I don't know when, sometime, the receptionist called me to the office, I mean to the out front. I thought it meant there was a good-looking man there, because that was our system. She'd always do that for me. But it wasn't. It was this guy. And he said, you know, Kim, you're the only lawyer who's ever sent me a Christmas card. And you did it when I was being a jerk. I wanted to apologize and to say, I'm here to pay my bill. Wow. Yeah, really wow. Because I didn't have any expectation. I was looking forward to suing him. And what I learned was when you treat people right, because we were in a conflict, right? Without any expectation of getting a reward back, how it can shift everything. Something so very, very small. I mean, a Christmas card had that profound, resulted in such a profound shift. And those two experiences, yeah, have stuck with me. And they continue to be foundational pieces in how I interact with human beings. Hmm. That's a beautiful story. I can see how powerful a shift that would be. When well, and it, even yeah, mm-hmm. please. Yeah. No, and I'm just thinking. And even um, I had a client who I worked with a couple of years ago who hadn't paid her bill, and so I just phone her up one human to another. How's it going? You know, she made some payments, and earlier this year, I was like, "How about you just pay two hundred a month?" Because you're going to feel so much better, even paying just a little bit every month. It won't be this heavy weight on you. And yesterday she made her last payment. Mm. And it feels good for me to treat somebody as a human being. Yeah. And it wasn't me against her, right? It's if you can be kind of supportive of a person who you might think you're in conflict with, who society would say you're in conflict with. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's how can I support this person so we both win? And uh, yeah, it's a good feeling. So I just wanted to share that one because it's fresh. Thank you. And it just shows how far you've come from conflict avoidant to the conflict queen of being able to not avoid a conversation about money or 
about being owed or whatever that looks like. What role would you say emotions play in conflicts? Well, it's interesting because we have a tendency in our society to talk about conflicts as if they're money. That is perfectly acceptable, money or stuff, but that's never what it's about. It's actually about the emotions and people not feeling seen or acknowledged. Mm. And it could be something in me, and often that's the starting point, right? Like, I'm uncomfortable with this, but I'm projecting it outwards. And I'm thinking about me in the car, right? (laughs) It was an affront to me that he hadn't paid. How dare you? I did the work, Mm -hmm. right? I felt very disrespected. Yeah. And so we feel disrespected, we feel unacknowledged, and we lash out. But we're treating it as if it's this objective, monetary dispute, or factual, I have the facts right, and you don't. Yep. Yeah, it's all about emotions. Right. And so is that environment all about this perceived world of separating the emotions from it? Right. When people come into into an experience of conflict and if they get to the point of hiring a lawyer or a mediator, they're not leading with the emotions. Right. It's like this separateness. It is this separateness. And I'm thinking back to the little four year old Kim hiding Mm. underneath that barbecue because I didn't couldn't express my emotions. We use lawyers the same way. We don't know how to deal with those emotions. Yeah. You know, we view them, we've, we act as if those so-called negative emotions, we shouldn't experience them. And so to keep them at bay, let's have somebody else talk for us. And then I won't feel them. I think that's the, um, yeah. the fallacy in our reasoning because we're uncomfortable with them. So let's have somebody else between me and this other person. It doesn't mm-hmm. work. It's a real source of a lot of pain for a long, long time. Mm, thank you. I have never looked at it that way. You just, I had an aha moment there of understanding it. And on this podcast, we talk so much about all the different ways we avoid feeling our feelings, whether it be through numbing, shopping, you know, drinking, drugs, whatever it might be, whatever our coffee. go-to is, get yeah, coffee, whatever it is <laughs> to help us not feel those feelings. And you just made me see that once again, this can be another part of our society where we're, we're trying not to feel those feelings. We're so can, trying yeah. to deny them. Yeah. Can you share with us the journey of becoming a mediator, moving from being a lawyer to becoming a mediator? What does that look like? Well, I actually, when I went to law school, I thought about mediation. At that time, though, you had, where I live, you had to practice law for three years before the law society would let you put mediator behind your name. So. I ended up working at a firm that was not a good fit. I remember when I started, I hadn't practiced law for two years then. I'd run away from law. And I come back to law, and I had annotated rules of court. So the court has a set of rules which describe how you have to behave in court and what documents need to look at and what the procedural requirements are. And annotated means, and I mean, and sometimes the court actually comments and writes about these different rules. So annotated means a set of rules that had those court references. I was the only person at that firm who had up-to-date annotated rules. And what I know now is I should have run, right? Like it was not a good fit. It was not a healthy place for me. But I didn't have much self-esteem. And so I stayed till I ended up on sick leave. And I was never going to practice law again, except my clients. The receptionist liked me. And so when people would phone looking for me, she'd give them my number. And I'm sure the partners had no idea. So I had 
potential clients, former clients calling me and saying, Kim, no, no, we need you. We really, really like dealing with you. So I started my own firm out of my house because of this demand. And that fall as part of reclaiming me, because the firm would never pay for anything like mediation training. I took myself off to Boulder, Colorado to take mediation training. So it was one of the first steps of actually acknowledging me and my interests in the whole legal profession. So that was, I mean, because by then, I mean, I'd had enough experiences in court. When I was at that firm, it was very litigious. And I remember one, we went to court over spousal support, over alimony. And the husband made about six times as much as the wife. We were representing the wife. But the husband's lawyer asked her in cross-examination, well, you're capable of working two jobs, aren't you? And our client, very proud to be a hardworking, capable woman, said, well, of course. We had not foreseen that question, which meant she, was, she got alimony, I think, for a year. You know, it's very, very capricious. And that was just one example of seeing that. And I also grew to see the courts have a blind adherence to the notion of what's best for children is if they spend equal amounts of time with both parents without regarding the level of conflict between parents. And it's the conflict that harms the children. And I actually went looking for the research that the court was using. And the librarian got a copy of that article. It was by a guy, men called Kelly and Lamb from the judges. But she also shared with me another article on the same topic, but was proper peer reviewed. Because the one the courts use isn't peer reviewed. They were citing themselves, no mention of conflict. And this other one talked about, well, here are, here's our hypothesis. Here's the assumptions we've made. It was beautiful research. And it's frustrating when you know and you see kids being harmed. And I think part of the transition to doing more mediation, the, the first firm I had, I was doing real estate and wills and estates mainly. I mean, going to court, you carry a lot of work in progress right? You're doing the work with an expectation you'll get paid from the property settlement. I couldn't afford to run my practice that way. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the shift. But, But when you see this, it's like the people don't matter. It's the property and the rules come first. It's like, no, let's help people figure it out because people are actually the experts of their own lives. And that's what I figured out in my divorce. So, Wow. How does mediation allow room for emotions? Well, I'm actually, (laughs) some mediators, I suspect, well, I know there's no room for emotions with some mediators, right? It's just because I I talk to lawyers, like collaborative law is lawyers train like mediators and they work together with their clients. So it's supposed to be a four-person team. And you're supposed to, in that process, start investigating interests and sharing the facts. And, and I had talked to lawyers who were like, oh, that isn't important. Let's, we just jump to the issues. And I'm like, you jump to the issues and you get stuck. Mm. So how I approach it is, I mean, we can't change the past, right? And yeah, if we spend time complaining about he did this and she did this, and well, you just get stuck and it creates further distrust. When in reality, this is somebody you loved at one time or who you were, let's say, a business part. You had really good intentions. You got along. It was a solid relationship. And now you want to just go, I'm using my hands to show people fighting. Well, it doesn't work. So I actually start with a little exercise to get people having more of a context of how they're feeling and how they're reacting, where they're actually doing. And then we kind of craft a eulogy for the relationship, right? It's like when somebody dies, an alcoholic dies, you're not talking about, 
this person was an alcoholic and how she wounded her children, it's like, oh, she was the life of the party. Mm. So it's from a perspective of what did you like about each other to start with and what were the high points? And it's a good place to start, you know, to acknowledge those feelings. Yeah. And it's a good way to see, oh, this relationship actually broke down a long time ago. The blame and shame disappears. Wow. You know, when you think, oh, we haven't actually had any fun together in 10 years. We've just been going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So it makes it much easier, um, you know, to set goals and have the discussion. The other thing about mediation is people get to craft their own issues. So it could be how do we have a, you know, we're, we're splitting up the business. Well, how do we talk to each other afterwards? Because we we're best friends. And how do our circles relate to us? Those are things that can be, those emotional foundational issues with a good mediator can be discussed. And people can figure out how we're going to manage it. I mean, I worked with one couple and they, uh, they were both involved in a sport with very few people. So we actually discussed how they were going to interact when they were competing against each other in this team sport to make the whole community more comfortable with what had happened to their relationship. You know, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> I remember we had lots of laughs when we did it. Yeah, you mentioned the shame word. And I feel like at the heart of so many conflicts, is shame is how we how we find ourselves in these places whether it's the shame we are feeling ourselves or shaming someone else and oh it just it really yeah i coming from this place of emotions and all the work that i've been doing myself to allow space for emotions i can see how this industry doesn't want to allow for that space yet is completely necessary because so much of our conflict is well there comes from these be, places yeah if we actually dealt with those emotions mm -hmm. and i mean let's face it like in the united states half of all marriages end in divorce in canada it's over 40 percent those stats say this is not a, an issue with individuals mm -hmm. right like this is something that we should it's more prevalent than cancer. Yeah. Like get rid of the shame. It's just people grow in different directions. Mm -hmm. But we don't have, we're not taught how to manage conflict. It's almost as, you know, like I think back to me, oh, you know, stuffing dirty socks in my sister's mouth was my way of resolving conflict as a teenager. Feisty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but we're not taught. Yeah. And yet society, it's, it's as if we're supposed to know how to deal with it. And, and how can you deal with it if you haven't been exposed to healthy conflict resolution strategies? Yeah. Feeling your own feelings, knowing what you're feeling, and then having the language to communicate that with someone else. Right? And feelings are part of life. Right? Mm -hmm. And to have somebody who, then to accept, so I'm angry. That's normal. Yeah. And I remember even after my divorce, grieving the dream of my marriage. And that struck me as so bizarre. Yeah. But these feelings are normal and it's just to feel them. Mm -hmm. And a really smart friend of mine who's done way more reading than me. She said, oh, yeah, I read, you know, feelings last for 90 seconds, and then it's mm -hmm. a story we tell ourselves. Yep, I agree. And that has stuck with me. It's like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's Let, like we yeah. come up with, with versions to protect our tender hearts, versions of reality. Yes. And as I said, you know, if I can use this lawyer, because that means I'm protecting my tender heart, but actually you're not protecting your tender heart with a lawyer, you're creating a lot more trauma. 
Let's talk about the holidays. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for giving us so much framework and understanding of conflict and, and what it can look like. And so we're going into this holiday season. Do you have tips for whether it is maybe creating expectations, maybe it's in the moment conflict. You're at the dinner table and somebody in your family said something that really triggers you. Do you have any tips for helping us navigate conflicts with family, holidays, what that looks like? Well, I'm just thinking my father has decided that poor Putin, this is my father's take on the war. Yep. Which is something that I don't agree with. What I do with him is I know I'm not going to change his mind. I mean, I'm thinking, why are you listening to these news sources? Like, oh. And I have tried to raise, you know, counters to him gently. Like I remember saying, well, you know, about six years ago, remember I dated that guy from Finland and we were communicating on Facebook Messenger. And he shared with me how terrified they were that Russia was going to invade. I said, this is like six years ago. So this tells me that Putin is not this poor maligned character, right? And, mm -hmm. and that didn't sink in. So that was the extent. It was this personal statement, personal observation, sharing somebody who he met over 30 years ago, right? to try to give some credibility, it, it didn't work. So I look at it, there's a couple things. First off, right, like what's important is, I think, like my dad's 81, and he's had some heart issues, and it's my relationship with him that's more important than this political discussion. We're going to have, I accept, I'm not going to convince him. And if people can start from that, perspective that we can have this disagreement mm -hmm. over different subjects and we can still love each other and that love is important. The other thing, I used to get bent out of shape when I'd go to my parents because their way of doing things, very, very different than mine. And I remember once I got up early and I made, it was Sunday, my mom always makes waffles Sunday morning. Well, I had this recipe for banana pancakes memorized, and I thought, oh, she works so hard. I'm just going to make banana pancakes. My mom was livid. I do not like cooked bananas. And, and I mean, the kitchen is her power space. Mm -hmm. It's the place where she feels the most secure. So I was miffed. I was hurt. But looking at it afterwards, it was like, well, Kim, you invaded her power space and she loves her Sunday morning waffles. So when you're in somebody else's turf, yep. it's, it's their rules. And we tend to think, well, I got to be myself all the time. If you're there for three days or five days, you can live with somebody else's rules, mm -hmm. right? Or if they come to your house and if they're making comments, it's just like, well, this is the way we live. Please respect us. Yep. I love you, and I'm really happy you're here, and, and I hope you'll just accept us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if things are really getting heated or you have to have a serious discussion, it's starting with some of those good memories. Yeah. Can really shift the dynamic. There's a need to be curious and not furious. And by that, I'm like, it's easy, you know, like... That situation with my mom, it could have completely broken down. If I had been, I was just trying to be kind and you don't appreciate it. And how dare you? Right? It would have been World War III. But by being curious, it's like, oh, yeah, that's her power space. And I'm like, okay, so that's easier for me. Yeah, it's more work for her. But if that's how she wants it, that is her decision. Yeah. And I think not taking things personally, like we travel with the greyhounds to my parents mm -hmm. and my mom hates the dog hair. <laughs> and I just say to my kids now, well, 
she's got the dogs to complain about instead of us. It's a win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's just loving people. Like we're not always going to like people's behavior. Yeah. And it's, if you think about what if this was the last time I was ever going to see this person, how would I behave? Mm -hmm. That can create space for grace. Yeah. Because most things are not life or death. Like if somebody is abusing a child, well, then of course you step in. Yep. But most of the things we get bent out of shape about don't require that level of forcefulness of a response. And sometimes with my clients, I talk about above the waterline and below the waterline. And that's something I got from a book by Lance Secretan, I think called Reclaiming Higher Ground. But if you approach conflict from the perspective of I'm in a canoe, and is this subject that's getting under my skin, is this something that's above the waterline or below the waterline? And if it's above the waterline, just let it go. Mm -hmm. And if it's below the waterline, then you raise it. Okay. Yeah. So last week on vacation with my daughter, I was out walking my friend's dog. And I came back and my daughter had ordered Skip the Dishes for herself. When she knew there was a meal being prepared, she took my credit card from my wallet. Mm -hmm. And I thought about saying something because that's invading my space. And then I thought, you know, it's like 15 bucks. Who cares? I'll raise it another time. She's happy right now. We're having fun. This is not the time to mention this boundary and that my credit card is not hers. Yeah. Hmm. So. Oh, I love that. The canoe analogy. I'm a very visual person. Yeah. So that works for me. Now, in the United States, we're having a lot of conversations about abortion. And here we are bringing together people, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. you with your father. What happens if there is the conversation turns away that's really polarizing at dinner? Is there a way in the moment to shut that down? So for us that have been conflict avoidant, you know, we can just let that person go on in a really uncomfortable kind of conversation. Is there a way to shut that down? Well, and it might be to say, you know, I, I respect your opinion. And I'm really enjoying dinner. And I'm really enjoying all of us being together. And I'd like to create, can, can we create happy memories? Mm. And agree that there's certain topics we're not going to discuss right now. Yeah. Because wow. I love you. And as I said, there's so much negativity in the world. I would love for this meal to be us creating happy memories. Mm. And if the person really wants to push it, I'm like, will this change? Like, is this an immediate threat to us in this moment? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, can we just agree to leave them? Because surely we can find things to talk about that are more uplifting. Because, hmm. you know, and, and maybe we go around and, and share things we're thankful for. Wouldn't that be a lovely new family tradition? Yes. At the dinner table, or even better, to share things I'm thankful for for each person at that table. I love that. If we take turns, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and implement that one. That's really powerful to say something yeah. about someone else. The podcast that was coming out today was all about gratitude. And what I learned in my research of gratitude that was a little different than what I had thought, it's one thing to make a list of all the things you're grateful for, but the most powerful form of gratitude is when someone receives gratitude so what I'm envisioning is when you're sitting at the table and you say about, you know, your sister sitting next to you, you say something you're so grateful for about that person, the way that they receive it is the most powerful form of gratitude wow. that we can experience. So I love that. Thank you. 
I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was, I was in a conflict once with a coworker and uh, I ended up thinking about what's he here to teach me? And that shifted everything without having to have this head to head discussion. Mm -hmm. So that was part of where that came from. It was like, oh, yeah, but it's not something I've tried. I'm thinking that could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. My family still isn't into feelings, so it could be interesting. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> we, we'll go gently. We'll go gently with them. Exactly. Yeah. Or it could even be, you know, if people aren't comfortable with expressing themselves verbally, mm -hmm. you write something down for everybody. Yes. And then everybody has an envelope to mm -hmm. read. And in the research about gratitude, that is just as powerful as somebody saying it out loud to you is actually reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do I it. I think that would just really light people up. And yeah. Because we tend to focus on what's dividing us instead right. of what's bringing us together. And I loved how you shared that example of how to speak at the dinner table is bringing that back to what's connecting us versus what's dividing us. Let's not focus yeah. on that. It was such a beautiful, beautiful way of expressing it and not taking anything personally. That's one that I, I heard you say, and I am deeply working on that. Well, it's hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're all like, I think 98% of us are doing the absolute best we can. Mm -hmm. Is it perfect from this so-called objective standard? Oh, no. Yeah. But is it real and heartfelt with the right motivation? You bet. Mm -hmm. And if we can honor that in people, their motivation, of course, things rise in a good way. Yeah. I, so. Mm -hmm. so many good tips. Thank you. I feel... Much more confident going into the holiday season, being able to, to use some of these strategies. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Sure. All right. What is your favorite book? I actually have two favorite books. And one is Richard Bach's Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. And I think the, uh, and that one, you know, it's been like almost 40 years. And then the other one I adore is The Little Prince. Mm. So they both appear to be very childlike and for kids, and they so are not. Yeah. Mm. Adding those to the list. What are you currently reading? I'm currently reading Essentialism by Greg McEwen. Mm. Love and, that book. And also The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Ooh, what's the Miracle Morning about? It is about simple practices that lead to transformation. So like 10 minutes of silence or meditation or prayer and 10 minutes of affirmations and 10 minutes of visualization and 10 minutes of reading, 10 minutes of journaling, 10 minutes of exercise first thing in the morning to create this really miraculous feeling in you. and. Uh, so you can live your best life instead of being stuck in mediocrity. Mm, we all want that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, what is one thing you know for sure? One thing I know for sure, we're part of the earth. We're not superior. Mm, I love that. And do you have a favorite quote you'd like to leave us with? Well, it's going to be one from The Little Prince. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So I'll just do the short version. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is exhausting for children to have to provide explanations over and over again. Hmm. What does that mean to you? Well, he writes that after he talks about his career as an artist at age six, where he drew a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. And the grown-ups he would show that picture to would say, oh, what a nice hat. Because <laughs> to grown-up eyes, that's what it looked like. 
And so he stopped his career as an artist because of it. But it's, we become, and, and I guess it ties back to the subject here, Meg, in that we just see through these logical eyes instead of eyes with wonder and curiosity and emotion. And that we tend to focus on the wrong stuff instead of what is essential. Hmm. You've left us so much to think on, to ponder with. Thank you. Well, thank you. Mm, so if you want to connect with Kim, her website is theconflictqueen.ca. And she's on Instagram at the Conflict Queen. Who is it you are currently working with so people can see if, if that's them? I'm working with people who uh, don't want to work with lawyers with conflict mm -hmm. and with people who have some whimsy, <laughs> actually. And it's not just as a mediator. I work as a consultant, too, because I still have this really good strategic brain and being able to see people's motivation. But if you, for people who are in conflict, who want win-win and fair solutions and don't know where to turn, that's my people. Mm. Okay. And, yeah, families and businesses. Amazing. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for this conversation. Well, thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're ready to dive deeper into your own emotional expedition, I invite you to join me in an intimate eight-week virtual book study of Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. And in case you're not quite ready to join the study, I wanted to share a free offering that I often suggest to people as a little bit of a compass to get them started on their emotional journey, the meditation to alleviate stress. You can find the meditation and the book study linked below. I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you for listening. And if you loved this episode, will you please share it with a friend or two? Be sure to rate, review, and follow the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, so you're sure to never miss a single episode. This podcast is part of the Sound Advice FM network. Sound Advice FM. Women's Voices Amplified.